welcome back to the 6 o'clock news everyone. My name is Fungus Jones and you're watching the 6 o'clock... I, I said that already, shoot. Uh, I don't have a stupid joke to glide me out of this like butter. Uh, Australian history, we did it the last time, Kalamazoo. Like usual, we're starting with the whites. Last time I'm explaining this. There's some crackhead theorists who say that the Chinese and Muslim sailors discovered Australia via the Indian and Pacific Ocean way back when, but honestly, there's zero evidence for that, so that belongs in my previous video, basically. You should go check it out. Remember our good pals from the last video, the Dutch East India Company? Well, one of their ships, led by Willem Janszoon, landed here on the Cape York Peninsula in 1606. Over the next couple years, the Dutch would keep coming back for things like riches and spices, which they believed to be here. Even some random dude in 1616 accidentally blew off course to some random desert island in western Australia. In 1627, Australia's southern coast was discovered by Francois Thiessen. I don't know. And the northern coast was discovered in 1628. However, the famous explorer Abel Tasman discovered the island of Tasmania in 1642, hence the name, and named it Van Diemen's Land. By the way, if you don't know, Tasmania has a really beautiful landscape. Look at some pictures of the Tasmanian temperate rainforests online when you get a chance. They're honestly really beautiful, and I can't recommend it enough. Because the Dutch discovered it, this new continent went under the name of New Holland. How selfish. By the late 1650s, most of Australia's coastline had been mapped out, and they got a rough guesstimate of what they were dealing with. That was about it for many decades, and throughout most of the 1700s, Australia was mostly uninfluenced by Europe. For a while, it was just under debate whether to colonize it or not, and who should do it. Even though the Dutch discovered it, they refused to colonize it since the cost were hella. It was eventually decided that the British would colonize the East Coast. In 1770, famous British seafarer James Cook navigated the East Coast of New Holland and officially landed at Botany Bay. Also in the sparsely populated and scorchingly useless western coast of the continent, the French and Swedes tried to make little colonies but went nowhere. Anyways, the Botany Bay landing is the real start of Australian history. Really, the Swedes? At first, Britain had little interest in Australia, but after the American Revolution, they lost their North American colonies, basically their prized pig, and needed a new colony to exploit. So they were like, well, this works out perfectly. One loss, one win. So Australia came to light. The new region and New Holland they were planning on colonizing became New South Wales, and wanted to settle it with American Loyalists, Chinese people, and Pacific Islanders, who were totally not slaves or anything. <coughs> not to mention prison convicts. The convicts would be a popular choice. And so, lo and behold, on May 13th, 1787, the First Fleet, a group of convicts on a big-time boat, departed from Portsmouth, England. They cruised through the Atlantic before making a pit stop at Rio de Janeiro in Portuguese Brazil, then making another stop through the South Atlantic to Cape Town, the South African colony. Then the Great Perilous Voyage began. They sailed through the mind-numbingly large Indian Ocean to finally reach Botany Bay, eastern Australia. After hella sailage, they first set up a tiny colony on a land down under in 1788. Even though they were literally just at one spot, they decided to claim half of Australia, the entire eastern half of the continent, including Tasmania. At the time, it was still Van Diemen's Land, remember? Just for shigs and giggles. Also, a colony was set up on the teeny tiny Norfolk Island. Almost immediately, they realized that previous Captain James Cook hyped up Australia way too much. Oh man, it's like, oh, it's like so epic, man, oh, oh man, it's like... Dog, are you on medicine? However, when the squad fam got there, they were shocked that the soil was awful and it was all around a bad experience. <laughs> James Cook, you liar! It was like a permanent dog day summer camp. 
Soon after, they encountered the natives, who were wary of them and kept their distance. Unfortunately, setting up any settlements were difficult because European tools were not at all meant to harvest Australian resources. For example, the soil was extremely dry and rocky, and the trees were extremely hard, large, and thick. They first settled on just making caveman huts, but those were destroyed near instantly with the onset of ferocious sea and rainstorms. Basically, instead of sending qualified people, they sent a bunch of latchkey kids to the other side of the planet with the task of setting up a town. See where this is going? Before we continue, I'd just like to mention that in Australia, there's a type of crayfish called a yabby. Anyways, the eastern half of... <laughs> Anyways, the eastern half became New South Wales, and the western half was still New Holland. Also, I forgot to mention, this was the founding of Sydney, Australia. This city would become their main base of operations, but at the time, it was still a small settlement. By the early 1800s rolled around, they had started to farm much more of the land along the east, as well as explore some mountain ranges. They weren't, like, super tall mountain ranges, but, you know, high craglands. The advent of farming allowed for more free immigrants to come in as well. Sydney began to grow a lot and became profitable. In 1803, the Brits went from Sydney to Van Diemen's Land, remember the island of Tasmania, and founded the settlement of Hobart, now the island's main city today. The region of Victoria was also discovered south of New South Wales, and in the very bottom southeast of the continent as well. Australia started to become a smaller place each year, and also really started to shape up as more colonies began to be settled. In the 1820s, Australia's interior began to get mapped out as expeditions were sent far into Australia's inland. Being in the scorching outback in the 1820s with barely any water and being surrounded by hostile tribes frankly sounds like hell. The Swan River Colony was also founded in 1829 in Western Australia. The same year, in said colony, the city of Perth was founded, though at the time it wasn't a city, just a settlement. But, you know, you get what I mean. In 1836, South Australia, the actual official name of the region and not just a cardinal direction, was founded as a free colony, meaning that convicts weren't sent there to develop it, but instead just got regular working-class Joe immigrants. This was also when the settlement of Adelaide was founded, BTW. South Australia has a lot of large peninsulas that jut out into the ocean as well as rugged islands, and as such, it made for pretty good territory to build settlements and ports on. Three years later, a small colony was set up on extremely small Lord Howe Island, quite literally in the genuine middle of nowhere. 1856, Van Diemen's Land becomes Tasmania. Remember that now, it's the modern term. Back to business. In 1859, Queensland becomes a separate colony from the others, huge and situated in the northeast. At this time, the native aborigines saw the writing on the wall and attempted to flee after the ever-expanding farmers and settlers began to push them off their rightful lands. As such, many aboriginals were forced onto reservations, killed, or starved. Let's just back up a second. Everything was going business as usual in the fine Australian colonies when all of a sudden in 1851, gold was discovered. And boy did they discover a lot of it. Quickly afterwards, people from all over Europe and Asia began to rapidly flock to live and work in Australia. The colony of Victoria exploded the most increasing in population by 597% in 8 years. That's almost a 75% increase every single year. This also led to a lot of fighting and minor rebellions, starting the beginnings of Australian democracy. Because of all the workers, the main working class of Australia got skilled far more than others, meaning that they could work shorter days, get benefits, and also form unions. They lived better than their European colonizers at home. The massive gold boom in Australia led to rapid development, meaning that in only a few short decades, Australia rapidly industrialized. In fact, Melbourne, what used to be a small settlement on an isolated continent, at that time became the richest city in the world. Australia gained ocean, rail, and river transport systems pretty quickly. 
Also, the telegraph got introduced in 1854 in Melbourne, Sydney, and Adelaide. Pat yourselves on the back, you guys. Good job. In 1868, the last ship full of convicts arrived in Australia, and after that, t'was no more. By this time, many Australians were native-born, but also, Australia was relatively pretty darn modernized. Around the 1880s, the want for independence began to grow. Throughout the late half of the 1800s, Australians wanted more and more for independence from Britain and rule their own country instead of the faraway British Isles. After decades of deliberation, Australia finally got their independence in 1901 and became a Commonwealth country. Almost immediately, however, as a new country, this new Australia found itself wrapped up in a lot of conflicts like the Boer War, World War I, it was kind of a mess. However, overall, it was pretty satisfying for the Australian population to have a country for themselves, and at the end of the war, they joined the League of Nations. World War II was when things started to go downhill, then uphill. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, Britain and the Allies declared war on the Nazis, and due to Australia's turbo-close ties to Britain, they in turn declared war as well. Japan was also allied with Germany, and while Germany couldn't do anything to Australia because of the distance, Japan was pretty close. So when Japan started invading Southeast Asia and Oceania, like the Pacific Islands, Australia was like, nah, -uh, not in my joint. They fought back against the encroaching Japanese who were blazing through Southeast Asia, specifically the island of New Guinea, which Australia had some control over. And as it turns out, Australia was actually hella good at fighting and kicked out the Japanese from the island. In response, Japan sent bomber planes to fly over the city of Darwin along Australia's northern coast and devastated the city. There were also many sub-attacks in Sydney that the Japanese sent to mess up the place, after the war, there was a big economic boom that saw the rise of a lot of immigration to Australia, specifically from Communist Asia. During the 1950s, Australia received a heck of a lot of immigrants from the Soviet Union, Korea, and the newly formed Communist China. With this new economic boom, however, they began to export bazonker amounts of resources to their chief trading partners, mainly Democratic Japan, the US, and other Commonwealth countries. So that's where we're at today. Ever since then, Australia has become a modernized and wealthy country down under, and is a strong beacon for democracy in the Pacific. Allied with the West, Australia is a regional powerhouse and considered to be one of America's most valuable partners, as well as one of Europe's top partners as well, chiefly Britain. They share tons of culture with America and Britain, as well as the other Commonwealth countries. God bless, duders. God bless.